Hello and welcome to another episode of Take 15. I'm Lauren Foster. Crypto is a fascinating but polarizing topic, and to the uninitiated it can seem crazy, weird, interesting. Today's guest is going to help us untangle some of the strange and complex ideas around crypto. Meltem Demirs is Chief Strategy Officer at CoinShares, a digital asset management company. She's also a cryptocurrency investor and a passionate and outspoken advocate for the crypto revolution. Welcome, Meltem. Thanks so much for being here. So when it comes to Bitcoin, you say you drank the red pill. So I'd love to start with your crypto origin story. How did you get interested in crypto and what has fostered that interest and passion? Uh, sure. So the crypto origin story, I love that you use a matrix reference. So when Neo is faced with the choice, red pill or blue pill, he chooses the red pill. Um, and I think for a lot of people who get interested in Bitcoin, and really for me it was Bitcoin because in 2012 there was no cryptocurrency. There was just Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network. Um, for me it was really understanding, you know, until... I started working in finance, I really did not understand how financial institutions worked. If you think about the way we interact with financial intermediaries, really the role they play in our lives did take all of this complexity happening behind the scenes and they abstract it away. And we trust these intermediaries to do what is best on our behalf and to manage all of this complexity. And what was so interesting to me about Bitcoin is Bitcoin said the opposite. It said, do not trust, don't hide all the complex bits and pieces, don't hide the risk, put it all up front and center on this public ledger, the Bitcoin blockchain, and put it all on the end user. And so for me, it was just the start of a very long intellectual exploration into topics like Austrian economics and what makes sound hard money, what imbues things with value. Um, and then as we looked at what was happening in the macro landscape, growing up in the shadow of 2008, the financial crisis, right as I was entering the workforce in corporate finance and M&A, mm -hmm. obviously the world experienced this seismic shift so I think a lot of people of my generation just found it very, very fascinating to, at a time when so many things that we had grown up trusting and believing in were under assault and were demonstrated to not be trustworthy, the emergence of this new form of money, this new network, this new technology that didn't require trust in intermediaries. And I think that proverbial rabbit hole um, for so many people is where they get started. So put crypto in context for our sort of viewers and listeners. What's going on in crypto right now? It seems that there are a lot of macro tailwinds. Tell us a bit about that. Sure. So I think the biggest thing that's happening as we look at the world is $13 trillion of negative yielding debt. That's insane. Okay, in the U.S., we're in the longest economic expansion ever. 10 years and one month to date, it's July 2019, 10 years and one month, and there's no sign of that expansion slowing down. Central banks are printing more money than ever. The indebtedness ratio is rising more than ever. Uh, here in the US, uh, the co Congress just approved more budget hikes, right? More debt. And so I think everyone in the world is asking, well, what happens? In a world where we have negative yielding debt, in a world where the return to labor is effectively zero and all of the return is returned to capital, how is this going to persist? Add on top of that that you have a whole generation of people reaching retirement age. They're starting to rely more than ever on these entitlements that are underfunded, whether it's pensions or schemes like Social Security, which are not sustainable at their current growth rate. There's a big question around how we're going to pay for all of this. And to me, what people start to think about is, OK, Historically, you know, what a lot of people are relying on is this wealth transfer from the older generation to the younger generation. But in an environment where healthcare costs are rising, returns to capital are diminishing, right, mm -hmm. and prices are continuing to increase, people will start selling homes and properties. Will that mean the housing bubble pops? People are going to start selling their investments. What does that mean in a world where most exposure is managed through these large index funds, right? These passive funds that hold massive exposure to all of the same stuff. What does that 
mean. And so it fills me with great concern. And I think a lot of people out there are seeing the world in the exact same way. You can see this reflected from a variety of different investors. Many of them, however, don't talk about Bitcoin. They talk about a return to gold. But if you think of Bitcoin as a form of digital gold, as the digital analog for something like gold that has a tremendous amount of societal value, but also a lot of these features of hard money that make it so attractive, it makes Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies extremely attractive. So let's stay with that thread. What are the various categories of digital assets, including cryptocurrencies, and how are they similar to or very different from existing asset classes? I think that's a great question. Um, one of the key challenges here that I try to avoid is psychological anchoring, right? So even by calling Bitcoin digital gold, I'm engaging in a form of anchoring. Um, but one interesting way for me to think about it is there are cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and really Bitcoin is the dominant one. It's nearly 70% of the total market. It's by far the largest, most established, best known cryptocurrency. And what's unique about something like Bitcoin, um, there's three primary features that make it really special. Number one is that it's um, permissionless. Anyone, anywhere can enter or leave the Bitcoin network. All you need is an internet connection and the copy of the Bitcoin code that you can run. Uh, so this, this nature of it that is permissionless and anyone can interact with it's really powerful. The second component is it's decentralized, meaning no one entity or no one person has the ability to censor or block transactions on the Bitcoin network. So that nature in and of itself makes it tremendously um, interesting, makes it tremendously valuable. And then the last component is that Bitcoin is not backed by anything. It is a digital commodity that is backed by nothing but its own scarcity and the demand for that digital scarcity. And one of the key themes here is we're seeing sort of two competing trends. One is the shift from physical to digital. Most assets we interact with today are already digitized, right? You're not buying physical bars of gold. You're getting exposure to gold through the Spider Gold ETF for another product, right? But you're relying on an intermediary. And what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but also digital representations of physical assets on blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain are now doing is saying, what if we could give you digital representations of real world value, but with no trust in intermediary? And so I think that idea is very powerful. And the second theme, um, along with digitization, is disintermediation. Right? So instead of relying on these institutions who custody assets on our behalf, who say, yes, that share you own is backed one to one by the underlying, um, we're saying, what if you didn't need to trust an intermediary? Now, trust is what enables the convenience many of us are accustomed to when it comes to investing and managing our assets. But I do think that given the repeated abuses of trust we've seen, whether it's through LIBOR rate fixing, whether it's all of the scandals that have gone on in the world of finance, whether it's what happened in 2008, you know, trust is something that in today's financial world is very rare indeed. So Bitcoin is a $200 billion asset class, and you've pointed out that Apple has more free cash on its balance sheet than the entire Bitcoin markets. And for comparison, gold is a $7 trillion asset class. So is Bitcoin a risk asset or a flight to quality asset? So. Uh Great question, and I think there's two different things going on here. So uh, number one is we look at the growth of gold as an asset class. If we look at um, the advent of gold products, sorry, gold didn't really become a large asset class until we started to see the introduction of products that um, disintermediated the need for people to physically custody gold. So in reality, if we look at the gold market over the last 20 years, the physically traded volume of gold has stayed fairly constant. It's not increased much or decreased much. But the volume of futures, um, derivatives, and synthetic representations through productization of gold have increased 30-fold. Right? So a lot of the growth in the gold market that has made it a uh, $7 trillion asset class hasn't come through um, 
fundamental change in the demand for physical gold has been the proliferation of products that enable investors to easily add or subtract gold exposure through a variety of different constructions. Um, similarly, the phase we're at with Bitcoin right now, the majority of people who hold Bitcoin already buy into many of the ideas I've uh, sort of shared with you today that Bitcoin is sort of this durable, immutable, um, decentralized store of value asset. And so for people who have already bought into that mentality and are operating in that mental model, Model, Bitcoin is a risk off asset, meaning a safe haven asset. For people who do not buy into that mindset yet, who look at Bitcoin more as a way to diversify their portfolio and add this binary, really asymmetrical risk reward option really to their portfolio, they view it as a risk off asset. It's highly speculative in nature. It's either going to be zero or it's going to be a whole lot more than zero. And so um, I think it really depends on the type of person we're talking about. But for myself, certainly, I view Bitcoin as a safe haven asset. Um, and again, it's important to separate here you know, between the volatility of the asset and the cyclical trend versus the secular trend, which has been up and to the right. If we look at the sort of broader, longer term secular trend and the appreciation potential of something like a Bitcoin to become a gold, I think a lot of people are looking at that aspect and deciding this is something I do want to hold in a world where things feel increasingly challenging. So there's been a lot of buzz lately about Facebook's yet to launch Libra cryptocurrency. What is Libra and how is it different from Bitcoin? It's a great question. Uh, Libra is not a cryptocurrency in my book. Anyone can make anything and call it a cryptocurrency. But what Libra is, is Libra is a um, centralized network. It's run by Facebook and 28 of Facebook's closest friends, including some of Facebook's investors, including some uh, companies that Facebook executives are on the boards of, etc. So it's this closely held consortium, kind of like the Fed, right, and its member banks. Um, Libra is also backed by assets. Libra proposes to be backed by a pooled investment vehicle with two classes of shares one class of shares that's entitled to the principal, and one class of shares that's entitled to the interest income, right? And so the interest income would go to this network of people who sort of make Libra possible, and the principal would go back to people who hold the Libra token, the principal would. Um, and what really Libra represents, in my view, is a highly centralized permission network where Facebook and its affiliates can censor transactions. They can control who enters and exits this network. And it's putting billions of dollars of the, of the public's funds at risk, right, by putting them in banks. Um, Facebook is not going to take all of this um, currency it buys or these securities it buys and hold them in this disintermediate way. It's going to put them in bank accounts in foreign jurisdictions that are offshore. And so um, to me, you know, Libra in and of itself, yes, it represents a really fascinating innovation by a large internet platform to introduce its own value sort of um, me transfer mechanism. It's really more of a payment mechanism, but it's doing so in a way that is really, I think, intellectually dishonest. It's not a cryptocurrency. It's a digitized security. Asset management is a regulated activity. And so I think, again, as regulators look at Libra, it's really what they're trying to untangle. Um, it's not like Bitcoin. It's backed by assets, it's permissioned, and it's not decentralized. It's closely held by a small group of companies. So let's segue from there to regulation. Um, sure. You believe the next generation of regulation is not capital markets, but digital markets. So what should investors be looking for in terms of regulation on this front? Absolutely. So I think the fundamental ch uh, challenge for regulation is um, historically the way that regulatory jurisdiction would have been determined is by physical borders and physical boundaries. When we look at something like Bitcoin, which is a three things, right? It's code, it's a network of computers around the world that run the Bitcoin code, the Bitcoin network, um, and then it's an asset itself. The challenge is that something like Bitcoin doesn't fit into the concept of physical borders of the past. It's supranational, it's digital and fluid in nature, and it doesn't rely on intermediaries the way that a share of a spider gold ETF might, right? You're not going to your Fidelity account and trading it. And so that introduces a really interesting challenge for regulators because Bitcoin itself is not regulated. 
you can't regulate computer code, although we have tried, but I think in the United States, technically, that's considered free speech. Um, you can't really regulate the Bitcoin network. Its whole nature is to be open and permissionless. Anyone can run it, anyone can use it. And so really what they're regulating is companies that sit on top of the Bitcoin network and provide products and services to consumers in different jurisdictions. And so the challenge for regulators is how do you create a regulatory paradigm that caters to some of the unique features of this asset and of this technology that we haven't really seen before. And I think the second component that's challenging to sort of come to grips with is historically everything we do in the world of finance relies on intermediaries. That's where regulation is typically applied. If you go to the ATM and you get $100 out of the ATM, even though what you're holding is US tender, there's no one who can tell you what you can and can't do with that $100 bill. If we take that idea and we digitize it, that's really, in some sense, what Bitcoin is. It's You can't track it. You can't sort of monitor and censor it. You can censor the companies on top of it, but just like you can't control a $100 bill, there is this challenge of sort of keeping Bitcoin within a well-defined regulatory perimeter. So final question. I know that you're an avid reader and one of your obsessions is science fiction. Mm -hmm. So for our sci-fi viewers and listeners out there, what are your top three picks? Oh, that's a really good question. So I would start by saying um, reading is the best way to time travel and to explore the future because it's a great way to just explore all of the potential different ways um, what we're doing today could evolve and mature. And it's so fun to go back and read particularly, you know, 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s fiction because many of the things that are um, hypothesized about there, some of them are possible today. And some of what people are building in my world, in this digital sort of decentralized world, um, are sci-fi, right? Making science fiction real, which is really cool if you think about it. Uh, three books that I really recommend, and I have a list of 130 on my website, um, on my sci-fi reading list, but three that in my view are formative. Uh, number one is Dune by Frank Herbert. A beautiful book series, highly recommend at least reading the first one, but it's really about uh, sort of consciousness and um, purpose and just a lot, just a great read and not really so sci-fi, more kind of dystopian futuristic. Uh, the second is Neuromancer by William Gibson, part of the Sprawl series. Um, William Gibson's a well-known futurist, well-known sci-fi writer, but that book is about the evolution of AI um, and its impact on society um, and it's, it's just a really great thriller, sort of dystopian sci-fi thriller read and the main character, Molly Millions, She's pretty cool. She's one of my role models, so cool. And then uh, the third book I'd really recommend is a little bit out there, uh, but The Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. It's an interesting twist on uh, Canterbury Tales. It centers around this AI who is modeled after uh, John Keats, the poet, but it's a really interesting story um, about sort of this future world where um, you have AI and you have human beings connected across vast sort of galactic distances um, and what that means for the evolution of society. And there are these different sects that believe in different things. Um, they even have their own currency, um, but it's it's just a great read and it has sort of this really interesting historical literary aspect to it as well. Fascinating conversation. We'll have to leave <laughs> it there. Thank you so much for joining us, Malta. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider rating and reviewing us on iTunes or wherever you're listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts and it helps others find the show. Also, a quick reminder, this podcast isn't intended to provide expert advice on the topics we covered. If you need tax, accounting, or legal advice, please consult a professional. I'm Lauren Foster. Thanks so much for listening.